took a surprising turn to Iceland, hunting for the creature at the heart of the legend of Loch Ness. Now, I'm retracing the voyages of the Vikings back to their original homeland in Norway, to the former capital of their seafaring kingdom, Trondheim. I've been given the name of a professional fisherman who works in the 80-mile-long fjord that connects Trondheim to the sea. I'm told he's one of the few who can help me catch this mysterious giant shark on rod and line. I hear that Frederick Cullin even has photographs of this strange beast. They don't have this huge dorsal fin, barrel in the dorsal fin, and, and uh, the grey or almost black. Although I've never seen one in the flesh, I recognise this animal. In Iceland, it's called the Hauka, but I know it as the Greenland shark. A creature all but unknown to modern science, and first filmed in the wild only ten years ago. Greenland sharks live further north than any other shark, and they're the only shark to hunt under Arctic ice. Their range exactly coincides with the Viking's kingdom, from Greenland to Iceland to Norway, and most significantly Scotland. We know that the Vikings ate its flesh, so this monstrous creature is one they must have been very familiar with. But ironically, we know almost nothing about these animals. So the only way I'll be able to tell if they're capable of inspiring the legend is to catch one. But this is going to be a monumental challenge. Here, these monsters live at the bottom of a 2,000-foot deep field. Trying to get some perspective on this, I picture them as a handful of rice grains randomly scattered on the bottom of the swimming pool and have to fight the urge to give up now. This will be the first time I've ever tried to fish at such staggering depths, and I don't have much time to learn a whole new methodology. It's the end of autumn. As soon as winter closes in, shark fishing in this fjord will be impossible. We tried to hit the borderline between the rock and the, and, and the quay. It seems like they're cruising around along these edges here, searching for food. The logistics of working at these depths involve a great deal of precision, effort and care. Get caught in this rope, and you'll be on a one-way trip to the bottom of the fjord. We're going to be using somewhere between 800 and 1,000 meters of anchor line here. Right, so that's, that's a good half a mile of... Oh, yeah. I'll be using the longest lines I've ever fished with, so thick nylon monofilament is out. It would create too much drag in the current, and the reel would have to be enormous. Instead, I'm using woven braid, it's very fine and very strong, but it does have a fatal flaw. We use these long mono traces yeah. for protection of the braid. Yeah. And the skin is, is like very rough sand paper. So if the skin touches that, then it yeah. just goes well. immediately. I get to work baiting the lines while Frederick checks our position with first mate Willem. But there's already a problem. We've actually drifted out of position. The anchor has, has dragged. So we're going through the whole process again. It's taken an hour of manoeuvring, but half a mile of anchor line now has to come in before the boat's repositioned and it's thrown out again. Places up the line. 